Erev Tov, everyone. Good evening and welcome. My name is Yakir Manella, and I'm the CEO of Chazon and Pearlstone. Tonight is the culminating event of our Sound the Call COP26 series, A Jewish Journey Through COP26. Check out the full seven-part series on the Chazon webpage in the chat. Obviously, there had to be seven sessions total after tonight. Shemitah Shalom, everybody. So tonight we ask, now what? A conversation with elders and with each other. A movement town hall for this moment. All of us are here, I think, because we want to see change, to make change, to be the change we wish to see in the world, as Gandhi said. So we come together tonight as a community. Over 200 people registered for this from all across the country. And we come together now because we must because climate is the existential crisis of our time, because we are leading a transformative movement deeply weaving sustainability into the fabric of Jewish life, because we are committed to building a healthier, more sustainable, more equitable world for all, and because, as Hillel said, if not now, when? Because Owen and Pearlstone are merging and helping lead the Jewish community forward on these issues. We impact over 30,000 annual participants in immersive retreats and transformative signature Jaffe programs, Jewish outdoor food, farming, and environmental education, Teva Adaman, much more. And we impact another 20,000 annual participants through public education programs, thought leadership, and the Chazon Seal of Sustainability, working to inspire, empower, and decarbonize the Jewish community and redefine Jewish life in the 21st century. And did you know Chazon's Hakel Jewish Intentional Community Incubator Program impacts more than 10,000 additional participants through 130 initiatives in 30 countries all over the world. So together, Chazon and Pearlstone impact over 60,000 people each year all over the country and across the Jewish world. And I want to thank everyone here for your partnership and support, past, present, and future. And obviously, collectively, all of us on this call are impacting tens of thousands more every year because this really is a movement. We are coming together and we must. So where are we? How are we doing? How do we understand what happened at COP26 and where does that leave us? And most importantly, where do we go from here? Thank you all so much for joining us tonight to ask these questions together. And special thanks to the awesome Chazon Prostone team that made tonight happen. Bruce Spear, Public Education Manager, Hannah Henza, Director of National Programs, Liana Rothman, Jewish Youth Climate Movement Program Manager, Rachel Miller, National Programs Coordinator, and Sonia Sugarman, Chief of Staff. It is an honor to work with you wonderful people. And also huge thanks to all our amazing speakers and breakout group facilitators tonight. We'll meet them soon. We are so grateful for your leadership. It is good to be together. Limited though Zoom may be, we give thanks for this community, this movement, and this time. So we start tonight with a report from the field. David Waskow is the director of the World Resource Institute's International Climate Initiative. The initiative focuses on international cooperation, catalyzing national climate action in both developed and developing countries. David's climate advocacy has focused on impacts and equity, vulnerable communities, climate finance, adaptation and resilience, food security and agriculture, trade, and the role of the private sector. He's also worked domestically on low income housing and labor conditions. David has testified before Congress on climate and trade and is frequently cited in national media outlets. I also learned from David that Glasgow was his was it 14th cop. So while I felt like a deer in headlights over there, David is more of a veteran, I'd say. So here's how this is going to work. David will speak for a few minutes and then we'll do questions. Please chat your questions throughout the night to Hannah Henza and if you have any technical issues, please chat Bruce Spear. Thank you so much, Hannah and Bruce. And thank you, David, for being here. Please share with us your perspective on COP26, what happened, what didn't happen, and where that leads us. Um, great, thank you, Yakir, and thanks all um, for being here. And um, as Yakir said, it's uh, this is the 14th COP I've um, been part of. Um, and really working uh, as much as possible with um, countries, especially to move forward the agenda on climate change over that time. But this 
cop felt um, this cop felt particular and 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 it had a sort of different feel to it. E each cop has its own feel to be sure, but this one, I think, um, felt especially uh, particular. It, it came um, after uh, five years, but really six because of COVID after the um, uh, Paris Agreement was adopted um, in 2015. And this was the moment when countries were meant to come forward with stronger targets to take on climate action and also work through a number of other issues, including financing um, to help developing countries take strong action on climate, both to be able to reduce emissions and also to be able to, uh, to, to, be able to adapt to the impacts, the increasingly severe impacts that they're facing. Um, so this was a this was a key moment in the cycle under the Paris Agreement that's been laid out that uh, basically set a, a process in place for countries to come back every every certain period of time every five years and um, it was important because of that but I think also um, a couple of other things really. Um, uh, marked this COP in particular. One is that it, it comes in the midst of COVID and as we're going through COVID. And I think there were many questions about how to um, build global solidarity in the midst of COVID. There were even some practical questions about how people would come to COP in the midst of the pandemic, um, how um, vaccines would be rolled out for those from developing countries that otherwise might not be able to get there. Um, and so there, there, was, there were many questions in the air about that que a sense of global solidarity and how that could be reflected or, or might not be reflected in the COP. Um, and then the last piece is that I think that the um, awareness of climate change has, has been steadily growing. I think the sense that we are at a key moment, um, particularly in terms of keeping temperature change limited to 1.5 degrees Celsius, um, but also how to address the impacts that we're facing and that we see um, right before our eyes. All of that, I think, was in the mix as well. And so um, this was a COP that I think crystallized many of those questions um, and, and sort of we were in the midst of all of those moments together. Um, it, it was also a COP that, that brought together not only national governments, clearly they are critical to it, but also many states and cities were represented, including by governors and mayors. Um, the private sector was there and we saw in, in the streets um, in the middle of the COP, tens of thousands of people of activists um, and, and just people <laughs> really um, in the streets of, of Glasgow. And um, so th this was clearly a moment that um, um, brought together many different actors, many from many different perspectives, in fact, um, and from all around the world on, on um, uh, to try to address a collective response to climate change. So, so how did we do, I think, is then the question. And, and where do we stand at this moment? Um, I sort of um, have been thinking about the COP in phases. And uh, maybe this is from my sort of, you know, policy orientation that I thought of it this way. But um, in a sense, there were, it, it's a three act play. And we had a very long act, a year, year and a half leading up to the COP, many countries coming forward with their commitments um, of various kinds. Uh, many of those were in fact, long-term commitments, net zero emissions commitments uh, for the middle of the century. Some of them were the 2030 commitments that the Paris Agreement asks for. That's what gets renewed every five years or strengthened every five years. Um, so a lot of that starting back in really September of 2020 um, uh, was a lead up, a long lead up to the COP. And, um, I, I can talk in a moment about sort of where that left us in terms of action, but um, and temperature change very specifically. The second act of the, of the play was really the World Leader Summit at the beginning of the COP, which brought together well over 100 world leaders and then also led into many um, commitments from national governments, but also from a lot of other kinds of um, actors, states, cities, businesses. and. Um, it helped sort of focus global attention, I think, to have all of those heads of state there. And then we saw um, countries commit to reducing methane emissions. We saw some deforestation commitments. 
We saw over 20 countries commit that they would stop international financing of fossil fuels across the board, not only coal, but also oil and gas. Um, and we saw a, a large number of private investors um, representing one point three trillion dollars, I'm sorry, one hundred and thirty trillion dollars rather in assets say that they were going to support net zero emissions by the uh, middle of the century. There are a lot of questions about that um, commitment in particular, how that's going to roll out um, and a number of other commitments that came forward. That was the second act. The third act was really the negotiations over the week and a half toward the end of the COP um, that cum culminated on November 13th. And that was really about the path forward. What are we going to do next? And we knew at that point in the middle of the COP that we hadn't gotten far enough. And estimates were that if you added up the um, all of those net zero commitments from countries, that we would be on a pathway to about 1.8 degrees Celsius um, over the course of the century. Um, but we also had analysis that showed that, that we weren't really on track even for that 1.8 degrees, that if you looked at the commitments for 2030, so really what's right in front of us, um, that we're on track for 2.4, 2.5 degrees Celsius. And so clearly not enough. Now that's better than where we started. And I think it's important to note this because starting this process back where I mentioned a year, year and a half ago, we were at about three degrees. So we've brought it down to two and a half or a little bit better um, when looking at those near-term commitments, but we're not where we need to go to be at 1.5 degrees, it's very clear. And um, so an important question was, what was the COP going to do about this? Um, and the outcome I think was a decent one on that front. Um, um, although we're not on track, it calls for countries to come back next year with strengthened commitments. Um, and it puts in place a process around that and also a process around the long-term commitments that countries are gonna make to, to make sure that those are as real as possible. The other thing that was at stake was um, the impacts. And since we're not on track, but even, even so, even today, um, uh, even if we were to get on track, we're seeing the kinds of uh, severe climate impacts around the world, and, and you don't have to look far um, to see them. We certainly are seeing them in the United States. Other developed countries are, but developing countries in particular are facing these in ways that um, are, are quite um, severe for them, and they are particularly vulnerable. So an important set of questions was around what are developed countries with greater resources going to do to um, support developing countries? We saw some small movement on that. Um, a doubling in the finance um, for preparedness was agreed. Um, so that would go from about $20 billion a year to $40 billion a year. But we also saw a major gap. And that gap has to do with the issue called loss and damage. Um, that's essentially the impacts that can't be adapted to. What do you do when people lose their homes and lose their livelihoods? How do you support vulnerable communities and vulnerable countries in those situations? And although there were some small moves in the direction of addressing that, they were quite inadequate. And um, countries, including developed countries, including the United States, really resisted um, frontally tackling that challenge of how to finance those needs. So that, that was a major gap at the end of the day. I think in, to sum up, I, I think where we stand today is that we've seen progress, we've seen headway. Um, we're not stuck. Um, we, we are making um, some movement forward. And um, we see that not only with um, the ways in which commitments have been made, but also um, the shift in renewables, for example, the growth of, ele of um, electric vehicles. But we also know that we're not, we're not where we need to be and the problems are getting increasingly severe and we have a significant challenge. And I think what COP26 did in a way for us is to hold up a mirror to where we stand as, as a globe and uh, as, not only countries, but many other actors as well. 
where do we stand collectively right now? And I think what we see is that um, we, 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 can, we can move forward, um, but we're not doing it with the, the speed, um, the pace really that we need to. And I, I think more importantly, we often talk about pace, but I think more importantly, we, we're not doing it with the depth that we need to. We're not looking at how deeply we need to change our societies in our economies in order to tackle this challenge. So I think that is the, the task ahead. And I think, um, I, I think COP26 did hold a mirror up to us to show us where we may be doing well, but also where we are not doing as well and where we need to do better. So let me end with that. And I'm very happy to um, take any questions and comments as well. And I should note that, you know, I'm in sort of close to the inner, uh, you know, ring of what's happening in a cop, but frankly, sometimes I think one can see it and understand it even better from outside, sort of what it means and, and what it does for us. Thank you, David, so much. That was really, really helpful for me, even having read a lot of the analysis, like very clearly laid out and uh, clearly some insight there and coming from years of experience. So really, really want to thank you for being here. Um, and I'll start with one question, then Hannah will, will share uh, questions from the audience. Um, you know, just coming from someone who's, uh, this is my first time at a, a, a cop and, uh, you know, <laughs> wowed, overwhelmed by the intensity of how many different things going on and uh, seeing all the different sessions. And I was only there for the first week. But during that week, which was when a lot of these pledges were made, um, I, I, I didn't only hear the elected officials and corporate leaders sort of congratulating themselves around those pledges, but I also actually uh, heard from, in a, in a number of sessions, some leaders, you know, senior leaders in the environmental world from major international NGOs saying that they were impressed by how far uh, some of the pledges were that, you know, found, found meaningful. So I guess one question is just, were the were the pledges a surprise or were they impressive to you too? And, and you kind of spoke to this, but do you think there was a little bit of pivot from sort of just outright opposition resistance to we're going from denial to sort of delay, not if we're going to address this, but sort of how and how fast is that? Are we sort of seeing that pivot in the process, you think? I, I think we're seeing something of a pivot in that I think um, there's a recognition that when you come together in these in these global settings, that it's important not only to say, as a country, you know, we're going to reduce emissions by some amount um, uh, or, uh, or, you know, take some sort of um, reduction against business as usual as, as, as some countries have done. Um, but that it's also critical to think about how to work collectively around very specific issues. And so we saw, for instance, the uh, uh, over 100 countries come together on the issue of methane, um, which is a very potent um, um, greenhouse gas and and um, in the short term it falls out of the atmosphere more quickly than carbon dioxide but in the short term has an even greater potency um, we saw countries I think you know come together as I mentioned around this question of fossil fuel financing internationally um, and one can go through a list of, of these kinds of things and I think um, the actually actually there was also text in the final outcome that talked about um, phasing down coal, getting out of fossil fuel subsidies, um, action on, on nature-based solutions. Um, I, and I think there was a recognition that we need to be very concrete now, increasingly concrete in terms of the collective action that's going to be taken. And, um, and so not just have these top line targets, but also talk to the very specific kinds of sectors and actions that need to be taken. So that, that to me was an important pivot and I think can be helpful in terms of it's being more concrete um, for everyone involved. Thank you so much for that. Um, we've got a couple of questions that have come in on the chat. Um, so I'll, I'll, we're running a tiny bit behind schedule. So I'm just gonna share a couple of questions um, all at once and then you can kind of respond as you see fit. So the first question that came in on the chat, um, 
the health sector also made commitments during COP. Um, we often relate to the climate crisis and, and climate change through um, health implications like asthma from pollution or mosquito-borne illnesses or mental health or anxiety. Can you comment a little bit on the health sector's commitment to decarbonize and how faith and health communities can work together? So that's one piece. Um, kind of playing into that a little bit, we've got a question that's uh, a little bit about the individual or community response to this. You've spoken a lot about the large scale sort of global commitments that often feel out of our hands and sort of a little bit um, indirect to our lives. So do you have any advice on how we kind of internalize that or bring that home in a more concrete way to kind of walk forward alongside these big global commitments? Um, and then the, the last piece, um, uh, uh, another question kind of playing off of that um, that just came in, how do we put pressure on our governments to actually see these agreements through? Is that a place that we can take action? Um, and, and if so, what, what makes the most sense there? Um, and then the final question is, Yakir kind of um, hit, well, actually, I'm just gonna stop at three. Let's, let's just go with three and then, um, and we'll see where we're at. Um, great, thanks. Um, and actually, before I jump into those, one thing that I did also want to note just very quickly is that um, we have seen this wave of net zero commitments. I mentioned that governments have done them right now. 19 of the G20, for example, have some kind of net zero target in place. We saw um, um, actors in, in the financial sector come forward with net zero commitments, many others. I think we have a challenge now because this does set the, could set the long-term vision that we need. Um, but the question is how real it is. And, and so there are efforts underway, including by the UN Secretary General, um, to start to get a much better handle on what does it mean to go to net zero? And when does action need to happen? And what does it mean to actually um, get the fossil fuels ramped down in the way that we need to as quickly as we need to and so forth. So just wanted to note that as one of the, the dynamics that we see coming out of the COP. In terms of the, um, the health sector, I, I didn't follow that specifically. And in fact, you know, the, the kinds of commitments that were being made were, you know, there was across a wide array of sectors and actors. And, um, but I, I do know that, it, you know, concerns about the health impacts of climate change have increased considerably in recent years. Um, and I think there's two dimensions to that. One is the way in which um, climate change itself, including um, heat, um, will affect people, but then also how the pollution that causes climate change has direct impacts. Um, and the health sector has increasingly engaged because of that, but then also I think there's been a recognition that it can play an important role in terms of driving emissions downward and also supporting um, communities who are facing impacts from, from climate change, health impacts. Um, so it would be great actually to hear from whoever asked that question more about that. Um, uh, in terms of sort of how to take concrete change, I think one of the sort of get engaged in concrete change, um, I think one of the important things is that um, the COP really, um, there were many cities and states represented from around the world and um, including with um, governors and mayors and other city officials and so forth. And I, I think that that's one of the, um, uh, the avenues that may be best, in fact, to take forward action. And I think certainly in the United States, we're seeing the importance of federal action, but also that we need to keep driving action at the local level. And so that would be one of my thoughts about the connection between the global and, and how to bring it home. Um, and then in terms of accountability, I think we'll need to hold many different kinds of actors and institutions accountable in the coming years. I think that's, a, a, that's national governments to be sure, the United States government among them. Um, and I would say, by the way, on that front, that that's not only cutting emissions, but also this question of finance and supporting developing countries, it's quite critical. Um, and, and then I think other all of these other actors as well, and this comes back to what I was saying about net zero, I think we, you know, we see these long term commitments and we need to actually make sure that they are carried out in the near term. Thank you so much, David. Really, really blessed to have your expertise at the table tonight. Thank you all for sending those questions. Please keep questions coming 
to Hannah. We are going to keep moving tonight, but we want to gather all the wonderful questions and thoughts and uh, really have a productive conversation all together. And now we're going to uh, take the next step with a conversation with our elders. Uh, Ruth W. Messenger is an emerita board member of Chazon. She is the global ambassador of American Jewish World Service, AJWS, and serves as a social justice consultant and activist for the Jewish Theological Seminary of America, the Meyerson JCC, and several other organizations. She's also been a wonderful advisor to me this past year, and for that, I am deeply grateful, Ruth. And Ruth has three children, eight grandchildren, and three great-grandchildren. Thank you so much, Ruth, for being here with us tonight. Sure, and, and the, earlier, the earlier background noise, which you might have heard, was one of the great-grandchildren, but <laughs> cut it off to, to a environmentally sound bath. Um, awesome. um, um, so, uh, as I've told Yakira and Arthur, um, um, I'm not... Um, I'm a, I'm a passionate um, emeritus member, emeritus member of, of the Hazon board. I'm happy to work with Yakir on the constructive future of the merged organizations. Um, but I was not a cop and I'm not, I don't consider myself um, an environmental expert. I do consider myself somebody whose life has revolved around questions of justice and equity and somebody who is um, deeply committed to thoughtful, organized advocacy as a way to make social change. And so um, I approach the environmental questions and the reports from COP with, with those issues in mind um, for a long time. Um, I know people on this screen are way beyond this, but for a long time, uh, you know, in, in environmental awareness, which is certainly a first step, but seemed to me to be leading only to individual actions, which were sometimes brilliantly carried out, um, but people changing various aspects of their way of life from, from what they ate to how they lived to what they remembered to recycle, all of that good, but none of that geared toward making the level of radical change that we need in this country, much less in the world. And so I think a, a huge step forward represented by COP regularly, but certainly this year by COP, is an awareness which, which David spoke to that at least most people, including most leaders, know they have to do something and that they have to do something on a broad scale and that it will be better for the world if they can find things to do together and better for all of us if they don't just make idle promises, but actually follow through. That said, we know that the only way to get um, social change positions actually adopted is by organizing at the grassroots level. So a huge shout out to the um, youth movement and its representatives here. And they're probably, they probably are the people we should be listening to because they've been willing to step forward into a morass that some of us who have been working very hard for social change for a long time have left them um, uh, highly imperfect and they're ready to commit to organizing, spreading the word and doing what they can to make a difference. So a whole piece of my interest in the work of, of Pearlstone, uh, Chazon, Dayenu, and all of us is like, what are the advocacy issues we're gonna pursue? How are we gonna organize to keep people um, pursuing them? And I would say right now, particularly in light of what's happening in Washington, a, a deep recognition, which I think was expressed by some people at COP and about COP, which is that change happens slowly. And you can't make the kind of radical change that our our youth movement representatives here might want if you barely have a majority in the Congress and you can't make it if you, frankly, if you imagine that, um, uh, that, that only, the, only a perfect bill um, is what you want because that's not how we're gonna get from here to there. And we're seeing that with the passage of the infrastructure legislation and the slow movement toward the so-called Build Back Better bill. And neither one of those bills, as important as they are, for social change, for justice, and for equity. Neither one of those bills have nearly enough about significant environmental change that actually changes the number that David was talking about. And then the one other point that I wanna make um, here and then leave it for um, Arthur and then for the breakout sessions is um, I have, I'm proud to say that I have a grandson who here met him. Um, one, of my, one of my eight grandchildren um, is a, uh, a college graduate with a master's degree in environmental engineering, committed to this work, um, went to COP as part of the 
well, um, One World Youth Movement there, got interviewed regularly. Um, and I have his impressions and one of his observations, which um, if there's time, David might comment on for a minute or two, but one of his observations has to do with equity in the world. And that is a concern that the very developed nations of which we're one are making statements, hopefully not just pious statements, hopefully real statements about, you know, getting off of fossil fuels and wanting the world to go in a different direction, but that we are too often doing it in ways that will not allow for thoughtful development for many of the nations in the world. And that what options are open to them, um, you know, obviously it shouldn't be coal, but it's not clear that we should cut off their access to everything um, other than uh, because, because they, it, it's in some ways, it's a way of keeping them down. And so how you create equity among countries, some of which are um, in a very different place than the developed nations, um, how you encourage and allow their development, um, their job creation without simply telling them that you won't fund them to do um, fossil fuels, but you won't help them do anything else either. So I would put that as a pose that as a question for some concern and debate. Thank you so much, Ruth. We're really, really honored to, to have you here and share share your wisdom with us. Um, and now to Arthur. Um, Rabbi Arthur Waskow is the founding director of the Shalom Center and is the author or editor of about 20 books on U.S. public policy and religious thought and practice. He has taken a vigorous part in public advocacy and nonviolent protest on behalf of peace, civil rights, full equality for women and the LGBTQ community, freedom for Soviet Jewry, and the healing for the wounded earth. I will add, Arthur is also the very proud Abba of David Waskow, who we already heard from, uh, shepherding some serious nachas tonight. Um, and Arthur and I got arrested together recently. It was my first time doing that. And I think Arthur said it was your 27th or 28th time getting arrested. And he did it on his 88th birthday. Arthur, thank you for being here tonight. You're on mute. There you go. Thank you. Yeah, I just unmuted. Uh, so thank you for making this possible. So I want to look back about a month and a half or so. Um, round about Sukkot, uh, I was looking forward six months to Pesach and decided to check a calendar. And what I found was that Ramadan, Pesach, and Christian Holy Week, uh, starting with Palm Sunday and going to Easter, were all in, the, in April. And uh, I began to think about where I thought people were going to be at emotionally and spiritually and politically in the deepest sense uh, when that month came. And what I expected was that we were going to be feeling two things. One was that at last, uh, climate scorching, planetary scorching, global scorching, not just warming, was going to be real because of the disasters that had struck inside and beyond the United States during the previous year. And that that was going to be pushing people to a sense of real urgency. And at the same time, uh, Americans especially, were going to be seeing at their gut the paralysis of their national government, a deadly, really deadly deadlock. Uh, and that the result was likely to be one of two things, either despair or possibly deeper, fuller, broader activism. So putting those two sets of things, the calendar and this sense of the emotional situation of Americans, especially Americans for whom those uh, uh, sacred days would be serious, it seemed to me we could perhaps bring together people around those sacred days to take seriously what all the traditions teach, that the earth is also sacred, uh, and that uh, in Hebrew, Adam, human beings, and Adama, the earth, you might say in English, if you could get away with it, earth and earthlings are really profoundly connected and that we must act. 
So after mulling that over for a week or two, I wrote Bill McKibben, who I've gotten to know, and asked him whether he thought this was uh, just a crazy vision or possible. And he wrote back two sentences, I noticed with no capital letters, maybe his computer doesn't have capital letters on. He said, I think this is really smart. Should I get in touch with Greenpeace? Oh, excuse me, Green Faith, Green Faith. And I said, of course, Green Faith was, is the only national and international body that is awake with and in touch with uh, all sorts of religious communities, not only the Abrahamic ones, which is the one I was paying attention to is the April, uh, but Buddhism and Hinduism and others as well. So he did write Greenpeace and I did too, and now have carried on a conversation uh, with him for the last couple of weeks. For one thing, uh, it was Greenpeace, Green Faith that got uh, put together the action in Washington uh, that Yakir and I were both arrested at, uh, an action by faith communities, self-defined as faith communities to push the president to do more that he could legally constitutionally do on his own uh, that he hasn't chosen to do yet. Um, and it's clear that if there were to be a multi-religious commitment around climate, this coming spring, that it would have to include a serious commitment by Green Faith. So it turns out, yes, that's been their answer during the last week. They have checked around the world with the great religious communities and in the United States. And the answer is yes. Yes, not only for April, but for a major Hindu holiday, holy, uh, at the end of March and uh, the uh, March 20th um, spring equinox and early in May, the Buddha's birthday. So the not only the Abrahamic, but all the major uh, world religious communities are likely to be at their deepest spiritual awareness and they and we and I have talked with other people besides and I think there is a broad willingness to act uh, to prepare for this spring renewal of life that's what spring is in the northern hemisphere uh, the renewal of life in a planet that can't breathe uh, we have poured so much co2 into the oceans and the atmosphere that all the plants and vegetation in the world cannot uh, transmute that CO2 into the oxygen uh, that would keep a balance that's just kept life alive for millions of years on planet Earth. And so the CO2 and methane pile up and pile up and pile up. They heat up the planet and the result is we're choking. As a whole planet, we're choking, not being able to breathe right. So I think there is a real chance that we can shift from despair and apathy to a real commitment at the grassroots of all the religious communities here in the United States and in many other countries as well. And that's what uh, I'm ready uh, to spend energy on. Uh, I'm hoping that Hazon will, and I'm hoping the other Jewish groups will, and I'm hoping and have been in touch with Christian and some Muslim groups already, uh, and I'm hoping that is what will happen. And I'm really profoundly spiritually delighted that Green Faith has been ready to take uh, the role that I think only it could take. Uh, in stretching across the different uh, traditions. So I'm hoping that's real. And 
and not Thank just you. hoping, but working to make it real. Amen. Thank you, Rabbi, so much. And again, thank you, Ruth. So I'll ask one question and then we'll hear from, from Hannah um, in the audience, all the questions from, from all you out there. Uh, so my question is, you know, you've both seen a lot of campaigns and advocacy efforts over the years, major change on some issues and, and less on others, perhaps. And I imagine you've both had some great victories and some painful defeats. So I'd love to, to defeat this too strong a word, challenges, let's say, uh, growth opportunities. Um, so I'd love to hear a brief story from, from you both uh, about an issue where you've seen both great pain and real progress. You know, stories of perseverance are good medicine these days. And, you know, how can we learn from you? How have you been able to keep fighting over all these years? Do you have a secret, personal practice, tools for resilience? You know, we're all trying to summon great strength right now. And would love to hear from uh, you, Ruth, first, and then, and then Arthur, um, what you've seen and how you've drawn strength in the difficult moments. Um, okay, well, that's a, that's a huge question, and I'm not going to take lots of time um, from the breakout groups. Um, uh, let me say, first of all, which I said to you here when we were talking about this, um, short-term um, maxim is that despair is not a strategy. So, um, you know, that's sort of a negative way of going at it, but it is easy to despair about, about a variety of situations that we're in, including this one. Um, and I'm not saying that, that, we, that you can't despair. Sometimes it's despairing. Sometimes things feel overwhelming, but, but those do not lead to solutions and despair is not a strategy. And once you wrung your hands for a few minutes or, help, or tried to pull the bed covers over your head, you have to get up and face the world and it requires strategic thinking and organizing to make change. Um, so that keeps me going. The, the, what keeps me going the most probably, Akir, you read in the biography, which is three children, eight grandchildren and three great grandchildren. Um, I would like to leave this world. I would like to be sure this world is there for them and I would like to leave it better than it is. But in terms of um, movements for change, I think that's a really important question. I could go on forever because, um, first of all, I've seen some successful movements in this country. And second of all, my work for 18 years and continuing at American Jewish World Service, but 18 years running the organization, meant that I spent literally all my time meeting people who were leading efforts to end poverty and advance human rights um, in 18 countries around the world with none of the resources that we have here um, and who were battling um, really dangerous um, governments and, and corporate powers trying to keep them down and were nevertheless successful in when, when winning land, winning rights to land, winning um, expanded rights for women and girls, um, standing up against um, polluters who were literally not only destroying the land, but, um, but destroying the, the land and water on which communities depend and, and in many cases, which communities worship and value. So I could, so I, I can just, I spent a lifetime of, I've been lucky to spend a lifetime meeting people, most of them indigenous to the countries where they are working, um, who've accomplished amazing changes in protecting their families and their communities, literally standing up to death threats. Occasionally we have had leaders who lost their lives, but making vast changes on the environmental um, and other human rights fronts. Um, so I can promise you that it gets done all the time. Um, you know, you also, I would just want to, um, I don't want to take away from the power of those leaders, but, but you asked to mention, you know, some campaigns that have had dramatic effect in this country. And so I would just remind most of the people on this screen who are old enough to remember and tell a few people who are young enough, perhaps not to appreciate it, but um, the, the campaign against smoking in this country and the campaign for helmets for bicyclers, um, motorcyclists, and skiers were both dramatic changes in the human behavior of very, very large numbers of people. And we tend to, um, you know, some of us were 
promoters of them, some of us were participants in them, some of us probably fought against some of them, but we tend not to see them what, as what they were, which was dramatic campaigns influenced by what, you know, what used to be called advertising and today would be called social media, but, but you know, pursued by organizing, by messaging and by law um, uh, that were very successful in changing human behaviors. And if it can happen in those ways here and if it can happen among um, hundreds and hundreds of indigenous groups around the world that I've been privileged to know, then we can do it to save the environment um, for all of us and for our next generation. Thank you, Ruth. Arthur. So your question reminded me of what I think is one of the great lines of wisdom, uh, broad, broad Torah from, of all people, Tom Hayden, who said, social change is very, very, very slow until it isn't. And we've seen that. And I love that Ruth has mentioned the uh, change from smoking because many of the tobacco companies play the same game that the uh, oil companies have played in the last 20, 30 years of lying uh, in all sorts of ways, lying to Congress, lying to uh, scientists, lying to the public. Um, and playing on the fact that people were addicted to nicotine, as we are, uh, former President Bush said it once, we're addicted to oil. His answer was, we got to open up more oil uh, deposits in Anwar in Alaska. Uh, but, and many people feel helpless. Uh, we're addicted. What can we do? It's all our fault. There isn't anybody to blame. But it turns out in the tobacco thing, they were drug lords. Yes, many of us were addicts to smoking, but they were drug lords that were pushing the stuff and organizing the society. So you became an addict. And that's the same thing with oil and coal. And we simply have to be honest and say, yes, they have been able to structure our society so that it's hard even to get, you know, from Philadelphia to Detroit without uh, burning a piece of the planet to get there. So in that sense, I'm an addict, but I can strike at the drug lords. I don't have to remain an addict. I can strike at the drug lords. And that's what uh, we've done that to a great extent, not 100% with smoking, and we need to do it. Uh, I've suggested that congregations, religious congregations, should be creating oilaholics, not so anonymous clubs for all the people who have been oilaholics, who are addicts to the burning of fossil fuels and don't want to be, and who need each other's help to not be. Um, that's only one piece of what religious congregations could be doing. We could be bringing the Passover Seder, uh, Palm Sunday. We could be bringing to the streets. The first Palm Sunday was a demonstration that began in the Mount of Olives and went into the city of Jerusalem and uh, challenge the local uh, puppet government of the Roman Empire uh, and... Rabbi, I'm glad that you mentioned that actually because a number of our questions have come in specifically about both of your political organizing and political action can, um, uh, careers. And so I'm gonna try to summarize a couple of questions into, into some bite-sized chunks. So, um, Every, every question that's come in has really been about the human response and specifically about the Jewish response to this moment. And I think people are asking you both these questions because of the, the role as you've each described that you play in sort of centering a Jewish perspective um, on, on these social issues. So 
one question is, what is the Jewish communal role in a rapidly shifting world due to climate? And if this is the moment, how do we mobilize a considerable establishment of Jewish power to actually take action? And then similarly, what is the very specific role that the power, or what is the specific power that a faith perspective has on this work. Um, lots of folks are doing this work from a secular or a human perspective, but what is the power that faith, that Jewish identity or faith in general sort of brings to this moment and this work? Um, I think that kind of summar summarizes it all. Well, if I may take up that question, um, first of all, let me just mention a couple of events uh, seven years ago, and interesting, it was seven years ago, because this year is what's called a Shemitah year in Jewish tradition, the sabbatical year when we we're supposed to let the earth rest. Uh, it's in chapter 25 of Leviticus, in chapter 26, says, and what happens if you won't let the earth rest for a year, uh, said the seventh year? And the answer of chapter 26 is, in some ways, more powerful than even the urging in chapter 25. 26 says, oh, the earth gets to rest anyway on your head. It rests through exile. It rests through flood and fire and famine. When I read it recently, it felt to me like it was a bunch of climate scientists staring their hair and saying, don't you get it? Don't you get it? And it's 22,000 years old and more, 2,500 years old. Uh, the fact that there is a treasury of the wisdom of what was once an indigenous people of shepherds and farmers, and that that wisdom is held uh, not only by Jews, but by Christians and to some extent by Muslims, uh, that wisdom of indigenous life we've seen revive now. The indigenous wisdom that European Americans treated with contempt for 300 or 400 years is now being treated by young Americans of European descent as serious wisdom to be paid attention to. And so is our own Hebrew Bible, uh, even by people who think of it as the Old Testament. Um, so I, I took part in uh, pre-Passover uh, uh, street theater aimed at one of the Koch brothers uh, theaters in New York, where we had Mother Earth and the carbon, uh, corporate carbon pharaohs in conflict with each other. Uh, and it was funny and serious and moved people and made people think uh, in all kinds of levels. I took part years before that uh, in a Palm Sunday uh, where we took palms, waved them, marching into the city of New York from Judson Memorial Church uh, to what we call the pyramids of uh, power in New York in that neighborhood. And then came back and had a Passover Seder uh, where we people were willing, Jews and Christians were willing to say both our traditions care about the earth, both our traditions care about power that brings plagues on the earth. That's what the Pharaoh story is about. So I see those stories that we uh, that we take very seriously at some moments in our lives including Thank you. next spring. Uh, Thank you, Rabbi. Rabbi, and, and I think the, the breakout rooms are really gonna jump into sort of more around this practical work. Ruth, before we jump into the, the breakout rooms, just wanna offer you uh, any other um, thoughts on, on Hannah's questions before we do that. Ruth, you're muted. Um, thanks for the questions, Hannah, and I'm, and I'm glad that that's where several of them focused. So I guess I would come at it from two ways. The rabbi's already given um, 
you know, some text and teaching and holiday meaning. I'd love to go back to, I'd love his quote from Tom Hayden, um, um, say that um, I've always commented that the phrase set it, set it teared off is interesting because it's um, justice, justice shall you pursue. And pursue is really an interesting word. It doesn't say justice, justice shall you enjoy or justice, justice shall you create justice, justice shall you follow. It's like pursue, it's like chasing the fox in a, in a fox hunt. You know, it's, it's gonna be hard to get there, but you, you have to keep, keep on the case. And so I think that's, a, um, uh, that, that's its own religious message, which is these things are not easy to achieve, but it's our job to keep pursuing them, not to give up the fight. You know that we're instructed um, that it's not our job to see things through to the end, but we can't refuse to participate. Um, and I guess I would add to that, that which is sort of a little bit of, of spun around reasoning, Hannah, but one of the reasons to make this a, to recognize the spiritual power of, um, of a group that comes together around issues of faith and belief and vision is that you need that kind of sustained community effort. And that's something that faith communities can provide. So to do this on your own, you know, you're not going to get where you want to do this in lots of wonderful organizations, more power to all of those organizations. But there is a can be a particular power in doing this in a group that has um, a faith rootedness and a, a long term belief in social change and human improvement. Man, thank you, Ruth. Thank you, Arthur. And thank you, Hannah, for this great conversation. Really, really powerful. And, and now we're going to get into it. So we're going to break into several smaller groups for intimate discussions about all of this, facilitated by a wonderful cohort of leaders, each offering a unique lens on this moment, and particularly on the question of how do we move forward? Big thanks to our leaders. So we're going to hear a one minute preview for each breakout room, and then we'll all choose where we want to be for the next 15 minutes or so. Um, and let's see. Uh, yeah, and these breakout rooms will not be recorded. Um, up, up first, Jana Diamond and Shamu Sade will be leading a breakout room on climate grief. Jana is an Adama alum and somatic practitioner working at the intersection of trauma, healing, consciousness, and the climate crisis. Shamu Fenivesi Sade is the co-founder of Adama and Manag managing director of education at Isabel Friedman, where he teaches Judaism and ecology, turns compost piles, and mentors staff and Adama fellows. Um, Jana and Shamu, tell us about your breakout room. Thank you. Hi, all. So I'm going to invite us, we, Shamu and I are going to invite you to join us in a space for an experiential interactive leaning into the how, the how we are doing right now as we receive and take in and begin to process some of the information um, that's been shared this evening. And um, really to kind of uh, right to kind of cull and cultivate our internal landscape for um, our personal and collective uh, capacity to meet the moment um, and it's an opportunity to name emotions and when we call it you know we say climate grief but really grief can show up in so many different ways including a lot of things that have been mentioned already such as despair and helplessness powerlessness anxiety um, fear. And um, so our, our grief, our truth, our, our, our like hearts are not to turn away from, but to lean into the truth of the moment and to do so together in community. Um, because as we've just said, right, there's more power in community and we want to feel together to grow and to connect and to ground with our, with our times with these planetary days. Thank you so much, Jana. Um, next, Phil Aronenu will be leading a breakout session on fossil fuel finance. Phil co-founded 350.org, worked at the American Civil Liberties Union, and currently serves as Chief Strategy Officer at Dainu. Phil. Thanks, uh, Great to be here. Uh, we are going to talk a little bit about uh, how the, both the private sector um, financing of the extraction and burning of fossil fuels and institutional um, ways that we can address that both within the Jewish community and in the broader uh, financial sector. So uh, join us, we'll have that conversation. We'll talk about how it connects to what we just heard. Thank you, Phil. 
And next, Hannah Henze and Adam Berman will be leading a breakout session on institutional greening and decarbonizing the Jewish community. Hannah is the Director of National Programs at Chazon, managing, amongst many other things, the Chazon Seal of Sustainability, Jaffe Network Gatherings, and much more. And Adam Berman is a Senior Advisor at Chazon. He helped launch the Jaffe Movement in the early 2000s as Isabel Friedman's Executive Director back then, before serving more recently as Urban Adama's President and Founding Executive Director. Hannah and Adam. Thank you, Yakir. Um, yeah, as Yakir said, we'll just be leading a conversation uh, for anyone who wants to just sort of uh, either dip their toe into the water and kind of see what's out there or for people who are actively engaged in um, institutional or community-based greening efforts around climate action or other sustainability initiatives. Um, we're, we're happy to facilitate a conversation there about what this moment in time really means for each of us individually and how we can bring that back to our communities. Thank you, Hannah. And last but definitely not least, we are eager to learn from leaders of the Jewish youth climate movement tonight, Eliza Cotton, Sarah Gorbatov, and Liana Rothman. Eliza is in 12th grade and serves as co-director of Jewish rituals and culture on the executive board of the Jewish youth climate movement. Sarah is in 12th grade as well and serves as the education director on the executive board. And Liana is the co-founder and manager of the Jewish youth climate movement on staff at Chazon. Eliza, Sarah, and Liana. So hello everyone, I'm Sarah, and as Yakir mentioned, I am the Education Director at JYCM, which is the Jewish Youth Climate Movement. I invite you all to join me and a partner at JYCM, Eliza, for an interactive session. We'll be reviewing everything discussed by these incredible climate activists and leaders on this call through the lens of inter intergenerational organizing, which Ruth mentioned is the core of climate activism at this point. So. We'll be answering questions like, how can movement elders and youth activists collaborate to create big and bold change in light of everything we learned from the COP26? How is JYCM in particular doing this work through something we call the Shemitah campaign? What can you do to join in this fight? Such are the questions we'll be answering in our discussion-based session. And if you are at all interested, I invite you to join us to explore this very important facet of climate activism. Thank you so much, Sarah. And in addition to these rooms, since we have quite a group tonight, um, 80 people, um, I'll be hanging back here in the main room. Uh, Ruth and Arthur and David, welcome to hang with me or to go to any breakout room you like. Uh, for anyone that's interested in hearing more about what's going on at Chazot and Pearlstone, where we're headed in all of this and what our role is. Um, so thank you all. And we're going to now choose and we'll see everybody back here at 920. And then we'll close from there. You can choose on your breakout room tab there. And we'll see you all soon. So uh, we are going to just now move towards closing, but first by hearing about how that went uh, and just he hearing a couple, you know, just a minute or two of highlights from each conversation. Let's just do one minute of highlights. We'd love to start with institutional greening. Um, Adam, Hannah, could you share just a brief highlight or two from that conversation? Um. Hi, Adam here. Yeah, so I, I think what I took away from our session was just how inspiring it was to hear people's stories. People are so actively engaged in a whole range of different settings, from synagogues to um, JCCs to other institutions, uh, not only focusing on greeting, but also s focusing on activism. How do we get involved in the financial flow of, mon of funds to, to fossil fuel projects? And so we really only had time for a sort of a brief sharing and an introduction. And wow, my heart is full. And I feel excited just by the stories that I heard from people in our room about what's happening. Um, and we spent a bit of time at the end talking about Hazon's seal sustainability and our new effort towards making that seal about decarbonization and invited people who were in the room to join us both in the development of that project and hopefully be the first practitioners of sort of what that looks like uh, and how that rolls out in the coming months. Awesome. Thank you so much, Adam. Um, let's go to Phil. Can you tell us about the fossil fuel finance conversation? <clears throat> Yeah, uh, great. So uh, we, uh, I think I gave maybe my very quickest uh, presentation about where fossil fuel finance comes from that I've ever given. Um, and with apologies to all the folks in my group. Um, and there were some really good questions about how people can get engaged. This is like such a, I think a rich area of work. Um, and I would be remiss if I didn't shout out the great folks at JYCM who have been on it 
um, particularly around um, BlackRock, um, which is the world's largest asset manager with $8 trillion um, under, under management. So there's a lot to do here and really excited to dig in with you all. Thank you, Phil, and a great segue. Um, Aliza, Sarah, Liana, how did the Jewish Youth Climate Movement conversation go? Yeah, so we had a really um, great conversation about um, JYCM and our Shemitah campaign. And then we had some, I think, really great uh, dialogue between um, some of our uh, older uh, and elders folks in the in the movement and our youth and thinking about um, how can elders help with getting uh, youth involved and how can uh, youth uh, collaborate with um, with our adults and our elders in the movement. And yeah, we really encourage everybody to get involved with JYCM, continue to connect with us. Um, I think that Liana is going to be putting some resources in the chat. Um, yeah. Thank you, Eliza. And thank you, Sarah and Liana. And last but not least, Jana Shamu. Um, what can you share with us from your, your conversation? Folks, we're sharing about everything from uh, feelings of feelings of powerlessness um, to also inspiration. And I think the, our, our takeaway was that we are not alone and we have strength in experiencing both sadness, inspiration, optimism, and action together. We're supported by each other. Amen. Thank you, Shamil. And thank you all so much. I want to ask us all, let's just take a deep breath here. Let, let this all soak in. And I want to thank again, Ruth and Arthur for being here tonight. And as we close, just really briefly, like one minute each, any, any final thoughts you want to leave us with? Um, let's start with, with uh, Ruth. Any, any final thoughts? No, I think it was a great discussion, Yaku. I think you really set things off well. Arthur, it's a pleasure to do this with you. And I think we remotivated people. So I'm sorry I didn't go to the youth group, but I wanted to hear what the general comments were. So thank you, you care. And next time we'll do we'll we'll connect with JYCM next time. Um, Arthur, any closing thoughts from you? Yeah, you're you're muted. I'm hoping that one of the results will be, in fact, Chazon's bringing together all its uh, constituents to join with uh, Green Faith and other groups, the uh, Catholic Covenant, the uh, Climate Covenant, uh, with, uh, uh, with uh, all the groups that have expressed interest in doing this. Uh, because I think we could make an enormous difference. And the Jewish community will not be the least of what could make an enormous difference this coming spring. And I think that it won't be a one-shot deal if we do it right. That a great wave, a tsunami for the good, uh, really can continue to reverberate after, uh, after the spring. So I hope that that's what... Uh, uh, Chazon chooses to do. Thank you, Arthur. Thank you, Ruth. And thank you all. Um, by way of closing, I want to say a couple of things just in the last minute or so here. First, we will be sending out a follow-up email. Um, we had a big, big group of folks sign up and a big group of folks start off the evening with us. And we want to share with everyone all the things that have been discussed tonight um, and, and really try to figure out where folks want to tap in. Everybody has their own unique role. Everybody has a way they are excited to contribute and we want to create all those opportunities and support everybody. And I also want to ask everyone for your support um, for Chazon and for all the organizations represented tonight. This movement is so important and so powerful as we step up together. So please donate, please give your time 
and together let's build something really, really strong and special and sustainable. And this is no small task. The last thing I want to share is, you know, we're headed into uh, a special week here, not only Thanksgiving, but Hanukkah starting just a week from right now. And for me, um, you know, particularly powerful and poignant song, um, blessing we, we say, uh, doesn't always feel great, but I think it has some poignant meaning for us right now. In honor of the miracles and deliverance, heroic deeds and salvation wrought and wars you made for our ancestors in those days and this time. We think about the wars, but I think this is a time that's not a, it's a different kind of war. It's a different kind of transition revolutionary change for our society and it's not necessarily miracles but it is a powerful transformation that we're trying to go through um, and as we do that we do it together you know we step into this together um, and I can tell you that being in the march David talked about the march in, in Glasgow being in the march in the cold and wind and rain with 100 150,000 people from all around the world singing and dancing and chanting and screaming together. We, we don't know yet what is possible, what we can do together. So let's find out. Thank you everyone so much. Laila Tov, happy Thanksgiving, happy Hanukkah. Be well, everybody.